those of you online, of course, this is not the end of Mars Day. We have loads still coming up. At 11, we are celebrating Mars Hour. So if you haven't got your activities ready for then, now's your warning. Gather them, gather them together um, because we will be starting at 11, hopefully on the dot. Um, but we're now moving on to our next session. And for this next session, what we're going to do is draw on those two previous sessions, really. And this time we meet some UK scientists who are working on Mars missions. And what they're going to do is they're going to give us an update on everything that's been happening over the past year. And they are live, I think, from the Natural History Museum. And we should be able to connect to Alistair, Alistair Hendry. Hendry, Alistair Hendry. Hello, Alistair. Can you hear us? Hi, Fran. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Brilliant. Oh, well, good to meet you again. Um, and so it's over to you and you're oh, I'm really looking forward to this session. And so, Alistair, please take it away. Thank you very much, Fran. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. It's lovely to be here. Lovely to see you all. Um, my name is Alistair. I'll be hosting today's session, UK Scientists on Mars. And joining me today, we're going to have a conversation today about the NASA's uh, Mars 2020 mission, uh, which is a really ambitious and exciting mission to Mars, um, where we're looking to collect samples of the Martian surface and bring them back to Earth. And joining me today to talk about this, I've got four experts on the project. I uh, will quickly introduce you to them now. We've got uh, Professor Sanjeev Gupta, a geologist and planetary scientist from Imperial College London. We've also got Professor Mark Sefton, an astrobiologist and head of Earth Science and Engineering, also at Imperial College. Professor Caroline Smith, head of Earth Sciences Collections and principal curator of meteorites at the Natural History Museum in London. And Dr. Kieran Hickman Lewis, paleontologist and research fellow, also from the Natural History Museum in London. Thank you so much, guys, for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to our conversation this morning. Um, but before we, we find out a bit more about what you all do, uh, I wonder if I could go to Caroline first. Um, for those that maybe uh, haven't heard of it or don't remember, could you give us a brief overview of the of the Mars 2020 mission and tell us a bit uh, about it and why it's so, so exciting and so significant? Yeah, of course. It's an absolutely fantastic mission. Um, it's been developed uh, from, by NASA over the last oh, 10 to 15 years or so. So a lot of time and effort was put in by many people um, across the United States, scientists and engineers to actually develop the mission and develop all the instruments on, on the rover. Um, but of course, there's a lot of international involvement as well. So there's instruments and teams working from all over the world on, on the rover. Um, and maybe if you can get the first slide up, um, which is uh, the actual a picture of the amazing launch. So the, the rover was actually launched to Mars at the end of July 2020. It was a spectacular launch, beautiful day at Cape Canaveral. And you, there you can see the rocket launching, just launching off the launch pad. And I remember sitting and watching the launch uh, with Mark in my office. Um, it was quite nerve wracking. You know, a launch is we always hope it goes well and there's no problems. And luckily this one went off very, very smoothly. So there's the rocket launching off containing the Mars rover, which is in that top bit of the rocket, the sort of bulgy bit at the top. Um, and that had its uh, journey to Mars and it arrived on Mars um, on the 21st of February in 2021. So it was about seven months uh, that it took to get to Mars. But if you can imagine how difficult it was, because this was during the COVID pandemic. So we'd all been hoping to go and actually watch the launch in person. Obviously, with all the travel restrictions, we couldn't. We had to stay here in London and watch it on, on you know, live on uh, but by being streamed. But of course, all the engineers and uh, at NASA had to work very, very hard during very, very difficult times to make sure that everything was ready for that launch. And it went off perfectly and then again got to Mars. Uh, we call it the seven minutes of terror as the as the rover actually goes and goes through the atmosphere to, to land safely on Mars. And again, that went without a hitch. Everything went smoothly and it landed safely on Mars uh, in February 2021. And it's been doing really amazing science uh, ever since. Um, but maybe if you can go to the, the next slide, which is a picture of the rover. So I'll just quickly tell you a little bit about the amazing scientific instruments. We call them payload. Uh, that's actually on the rover. And this is a lovely image um, of the rover showing the six different uh, or seven different instruments uh, on the rover. 
Um, and uh, Sanjeev will probably tell you about some of the amazing images um, that the uh, mast can see that the cameras have been taking. Uh, there's a thing called RIMFAX, which is a radar that can see into the surface of Mars. Uh, MOXIE is a really cool instrument. Uh, this is an instrument that's been designed to actually see whether we can extract oxygen from Mars's atmosphere. And that's going to be really important, actually, for future uh, human exploration of Mars. You know, can we produce oxygen uh, for the astronauts to actually be able to, to breathe and obviously use? Uh, Supercam's fantastic. That's a, 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 a that's a, an instrument that's been developed between the US and France that actually shoots out laser beams and it goes pew, 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 shoots out laser beams and you can actually analyze what the rocks are made from by looking at the, the spectra of the puff of rock, say smoke that the lasers produce. Uh, there's a weather station that's really good that measures things like wind, wind speed on Mars, the atmospheric pressure. Again, that's very important to understand the environment of Mars, the future robotic exploration and human uh, missions. And in fact, the uh, Meadow Weather Station's also recorded some sounds of Mars. So if you're interested in listening to what Mars sounds like, you can have a look on, on the websites and find that out. And then the instruments that I'm most interested in as a, as a geologist and a mineralogist are Sherlock and Pixel, which are there at the end of the, of the rover's arm. Sherlock is a really amazing instrument. Uh, we use that to investigate the, the minerals and the chemical compositions of the rocks. And crucially, it's designed specifically to look for the signs of organic uh, molecules. So these are really interesting molecules made of uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sometimes phosphorus in there as well, sometimes sulfur. Um, and organic molecules are very, very interesting because if they're there in the right type of abundance and they're the right type of molecules, those could be the signs of ancient uh, uh, life on Mars. And, and that's something that Kieran and Mark and I are particularly interested in. They'll tell you a bit more about that uh, after I shut up. And then finally, we've got Pixel, which is a really amazing instrument as well. And that's also designed to look at the chemistry of the rocks, see what elements are there, how the elements are mixed up in, in different minerals. And so we often combine Pixel and Sherlock data to actually get the composition and the structure of the, of the amazing rocks that we're actually finding on Mars. So I think this is probably a good point to hand over. I think, I'm not sure who's going next, but there's loads, we've made so many discoveries, amazing discoveries coming out all the time. Some of them we can't tell you about yet because we're still working on them, but there's all really exciting things that, um, that the rover's done. One thing I should say, which actually I, I forgot to mention, which is probably the thing that I'm most keen on, is at the end of that robotic arm, so maybe if you could just nip back there, Alistair, um, at the end of that robotic arm, there's actually an amazing device. Um, it's at the end, I can't actually see because my screen is blocking it. If I'd move it over, but it's sort of underneath between that sort of roundy bit at the bottom. You can't really see it because it's hidden behind. But that's actually the coring device. So one of the things that the uh, Mars 2020 Perseverance rover can do is actually core. So take small samples of different interesting rocks and actually store them in sample tubes. And for the first time ever, we've done this. And this is really exciting because we're hoping in about 10 years time to actually get those samples back on Earth to be able to study in labs. But again, Kieran and, and Mark and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. But a really amazing mission, really amazing rover, um, the most complicated rover ever sent to Mars and the most sophisticated robotic geologist ever sent to explore another planet. So really amazing. Incredible. Thank you, Carolyn. Yeah, and you can see why uh, you were so nervous at the launch because the amount of technology that's that's in this rover and um, as you say you know there's so much complex tech and there's so many places where something could go wrong and, and you know you think of all the hard work and everything that's gone into just getting it ready um, I, I, I totally can understand why those launches are so nerve-wracking but the great news is it's there um, and it's doing some incredible work which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about now and um, so Thanks, Caroline. So you mentioned you're, you're a geologist, mineralogist. You're interested in in in, in kind of the rocks and 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 what what they're made up of that we find on Mars. But let's um, find out what the rest of our panel uh, does. Um, Mark, if I could come to you next, um, tell us a bit about what your your role is in in the mission. Yeah, well, I'm um, I'm a return sample scientist. So um, it's it's as as is Kieran. Uh, so it's it's our job to help guide the mission to collect the right samples for the analytical communities back back on Earth. So we're sort of custodians of the future. 
uh, we, we, we are the people on the mission who make sure that everybody else back on Earth who's waiting eagerly for, for uh, Mars samples in the 2030s is, is properly looked after. So it's, it's quite a responsibility to have the, have the future in your hands. I, I bet, I bet. Very exciting indeed. And uh, Kieran, what about yourself? So you've got a similar role to Mark in some respects. Uh, indeed, I'm also one of the return sample scientists on on the mission, so I've I've been implicated in in the collection of a few of the samples over the course of the last year over, over the Jezero the, the crater floor, and and as Mark explained, also uh, planning for the kinds of analyses we can do on these samples when they're returned to Earth in a, in about a decade's time. So, um. It, it's important, as we said, to uh, to collect to, uh, to collect a, a range of samples that will meet the requirements of a diverse community of scientists here here on Earth. When the samples are returned, it's our job to ensure that the selection of the selection of samples will meet those the, those requirements. Absolutely, I bet there's a lot of people back on are very excited to see these, you know, to get these uh, these samples back. I think um, so. <laughs> thank you, Kieran, and uh, and Sanjeev, uh, what, what's uh, what's your role in this? So I have two roles. <clears throat> so firstly, um, I'm interested in reconstructing the ancient environments in Jezero Crater where Perseverance is. So I look at the sedimentary rocks and look for clues in those rocks and try and reconstruct what the paleo environments were to help us understand the ancient climate on Mars. And secondly, I'm um, what we call a long term planner, which is doing strategy for the mission. And so I work with the project management a group of us in trying to plan ahead, thinking about what the rover is doing, because obviously the science team is enormous. It's 500 people um, and 200 engineers. So we're a small core group of about eight to 10 people who help manage that process of where the rover goes to, what do we analyze, how do we plan the science? Mm, excellent, brilliant. Well, let's uh, let's take a look at some, we've got some lovely images we're gonna look at and also dive into some of the really big highlights that we've, we've seen over the past year. Just before we do that, I've had a question come through uh, from Smallbrook School um, asking how far off was the film The Martian with the growing of plants on Mars? Could, could that work? So. Great question, actually. A lot of people, when you know, when you think about Mars, it's it's those kind of movies, that kind of thing that we that we we think about. Um, I thought the Martian seemed very accurate in many ways, but you guys are the experts. Um, does anyone want to take that? How how close were they in terms of growing things in the soil on Mars? Who's going to take that? I'm, I mean, I'm happy to. I'll have, I'm always happy to to, to chat. Um, so actually, you're, you're, the Martian was actually quite accurate, and in fact, they actually had advisors from NASA working with the film producers to make sure it was as you know as accurate, sort of scientifically and engineering-wise as possible. And actually, one of the things we know about the Martian soil is that it's probably not great for growing plants, but it could be done. And in fact, one of the things that is being tested, um, and in fact, NASA's just been doing this weirdly with some soil from the moon, is actually seeing how easy it is to actually grow uh, grow plants on the lunar surface or using lunar soil, because they'd obviously be in like a moon greenhouse, but also a Mars greenhouse as well. Now, with, in the case of the, the moon samples, they're actually using bits of, of moon soil that were brought back by the Apollo astronauts. Now, we don't have any Martian soil yet, but hopefully we will have in about 10 years. But because of the information that Perseverance has been sending back about what the types of soil are like, and also we have information from other missions that have gone to Mars, we could actually make uh, pretend, we call it analog uh, samples of Martian soil, so we can do tests on that. So it's not easy, but it is possible, which is really exciting because that makes, again, the prospect of human exploration much more sort of realistic and achievable. Absolutely, yeah. I think um, I'd be useless at this. I can't grow stuff in earthly soils, so I would be well, no good growing me, anything me, in I have a, soil. So thumb, I have like a dead thumb. Any plants I get <laughs> to die in about two days, so I'm with you, Alison. 
Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Caroline. Thanks, uh, thanks for that question there. Really, really great. But um, yeah, let's uh, do keep your questions coming. If you've got any more, I'll put them to our to our experts uh, during the session today. Um, but let's let's talk about some of the highlights. So the mission's been going on for two years now. I think there's been a lot going on on the surface. We were we chatted about this last year uh, during Mars Week. But let's see what 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 the developments have been over the past uh, twelve months or so. Um, Kieran, if I could come to you uh, next. Um, what have been some of your kind of personal highlights over the past year in terms of what the rover has been up to and, and what it's been doing? Of course. So I have to say, I, I think we have we have highlights almost on a almost on a weekly on a weekly basis through the mission. It's it's such a it's such um, a pattern, a pattern, a pattern of a patent mission in terms of in terms of conducting science in terms of assessing samples obviously as as one of the return sample scientists my my personal highlights over the last year the last year have been the uh, the sampling of my of martian of a martian of a martian rocks and sediments and the and the delit and the and the uh, and the deposit of these in the first in the first sample cache, which was placed down a little over a month ago. So, if you could go to, to, to the first image I've have selected, please, Alistair. You'll see in this in this image, which was taken just over a year ago, so uh, so around the time of the last Mars Day. These are the. These are some of the core samples acquired on the Jezero crater floor. So this is fr from uh, one one of the igneous igneous units called Seta, and this is believed to be some of some of, if not the oldest material in the in the Jezero crater floor area. So you see on the right hand side of the image. You, you, you have three core holes, three boreholes. And these represent samples that were taken out by the by the rover coring device, as explained by Caroline earlier on. And the one uh, at the left hand side of the of these of these of these boreholes, you can see also in the image at the top right of the screen and uh, in the top left of the screen. Sorry. And this is the the sample after having been collected by the rover. So. This is a uh, this is a, one of the igneous rocks from the Seta formation, and the sample is called Malay. Each of the each of the each of the samples is given is given a unique a unique uh, a unique name based on the outcrop from which it's collected, um, in order in order to help with the with with the, with the planning and the description of these of these samples. So. <laughs> this sample was taken about uh, about one year ago, and if you could go on to the next image, please, Alistair. You will see here is the, uh, the very same sample. You can't see it anymore because it's enclosed within a sample tube. So this is a, a sample tube designed to minimize uh, the, the <laughs> The interaction of the sample with the Martian environment in order to, to keep it as pristine as pristine as possible for us when it's returned here to Earth. So Malay, the the, the the core sample you saw in the previous screen was in fact the first sample deposited at the at the surface of Mars. Uh, it, in preparation for in preparation for sample collection, and it was it was one of ten samples uh, deposited in this in this uh, in in this uh, in, in this uh, initial uh, depot, which was completed about about one month ago. So for me, that was a highlight because it's uh, it's an it's another important uh, milestone toward Mars sample return. We now have samples at the surface of Mars in a place where in the in the sample return mission we we can hope to bring them back here to Earth. So that would be over the coming over the coming decade. So for me, 
that was something of a personal highlight, seeing how these samples, we as the as a as a team, and indeed the, the return sample scientists within the, the the team have selected as samples that could answer a myriad, hopefully, of science of science questions here here on Earth. Uh, it's it's particularly pleasing to see those. <laughs> those samples now on the surface of Mars ready to be returned. Excellent. Yeah, it is very exciting to see. And it's to me, it's just it's so impressive. You think about the, the, the technology and the and the skills required to get, you know, this is already before this has even come back to Earth. This is a phenomenal achievement and, and seeing those those uh, the images of those of those little capsules on the on the surface. You think that's that is a huge achievement in and of itself. Um, so, yeah, really, really exciting. Excellent. Um, Mark, if I could come to you next, um, you're an astrobiologist. What's what's been your highlights uh, of the last 12 months on Mars? Well, as Kira said, there's been um, every day is a, is a, uh, a highlight. Um, I think looking at the um, echo sheltered igneous rocks, that was a surprise at the start. Um, and so from an astrobiological point of view, you start to reframe your questions. We start to think about origin of life scenarios and uh, habitability uh, in aqueously transformed igneous rocks. And then as we move up towards the delta, you start to see finer grain materials. And of course, finer grain materials we'll talk about when we get to the slides. Uh, they, they, they're particularly interesting from a, an astrobiologist point of view. I think as a as a initially trained as a geologist, one of the nicest things about the year is that we've actually moved across some rock. Um, if you're in the field, and you can't quite work out what's going on, you just walk a bit further. It's incredibly frustrating being on a space mission because you have to type in the instructions and, and wait 24 hours till you get your next, next luck. And so after a year, you've probably done what you would normally do in the field in uh, you know, a couple of days. So um, it's, mm. it's nice to have that, that, that overview. Yeah, oh, I can imagine that's really difficult to kind of get used to that you want to see something, but it's going to it could take literally days, weeks, even months to get things in position to go and study them and, and, and see them. So yeah, uh, excellent. Um, well, let's let's have a look um, at some of your uh, your highlights uh, uh, images that you you uh, brought us today. So here we can see um, these capsules. This is what um, Kieran mentioned as well. Uh, let's have a look at uh, have a look at these. So is this uh, is this the same one or are these lo lots of them? What are we looking at here? Well, these are these are the um, you know the ten samples that have been deposited uh, for the you know the first depot. So this is the um, if you think about what happened with the with the Apollo samples. I mean, Caroline said that we're still working on the Apollo samples now, and cutting edge research is still taking place on on samples that were collected in the 1970s. Um, you know what a future there's going to be for these samples. The first samples returned from Mars selected by geologists for analytical um, geological types back on Earth. And there's a whole, uh, the, these capsules represent our dreams and aspirations for the future. So um, these sample tubes, so it's, it's, it's going to be really exciting to uh, start making plans to bring these or other, other uh, sample tubes uh, back to Earth. And uh, as I think we've alluded to, um, what is in there has to satisfy the hopes and ambitions of the analytical community back on Earth. And we're a diverse bunch. So there's there's lots of different types of analyses that need to take place, lots of different types of science that need to be investigated. And uh, hopefully the, the collection of samples that were put together will be, um, will, you know, will satisfy everybody's requirements. Yes, and I th yeah, because this has never been done before. There's going to be a long line of scientists wanting to get their little piece of, of, of these samples to do their particular little bit of analysis on. Um, I, we don't have to go into it now, but I imagine there's already been a lot of conversations about who's getting what and how much you get and things like that. Um, because well, uh, there, there will be very formal procedures for that. We, there's been conversations about uh, making the samples safe from a planetary protection point of view, there's a lot of work on that, published the paper, sample safety assessment framework. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, that that's a whole new batch of um, science, sort of thing that Caroline knows very well as a, as a meteorite curator and distributor of samples. 
Yes, yes. Uh, the, the collections in the museum, of course, that go out around the world so people can can study them. Wonderful. Thanks, Mark. I'm going to move on to Sanjeev very quickly because I know we'll we'll rapidly run out of time before Mars Hour kicks off at uh, at 11. Uh, Sanjeev, thanks. Thanks for joining us today. Can you tell us um, what, what have been your personal highlights? Because I know you've been very involved with this over the past 12 months. Yes, I'm very, very involved with the planning of the mission on a day to day basis. And one of the reasons that Jezero was picked for Perseverance uh, was this deposit in the western part of the crater, uh, this sedimentary fan or po and possible delta, the Jezero Western Delta, um, being a possible environment where rivers fed into an ancient lake. And for the past year, we've been analysing and exploring this. So the excitement has really been exploring. Um, and what's great about being part of an active mission is that you're deciding where the rover goes to and what it investigates. So it's not just analysing the final results, but you say go here and we drive to some locality, we strategize on how we will examine a rock outcrop and then we make measurements and we might sample or not sample. We have to make those decisions and then we get the results back and then in 10 years time we'll have the samples back. So in the past year we've been analysing the front of this Jezero Delta fan deposit and you can see the white line show where the rover traverses are. We've been going in multiple directions as we try and work out exactly what rocks to look at and try and reconstruct. Um, and it's just been spectacular. And if you go to the next slide, um, what you um, yeah, what you can see here is just a view of the landscape. So this the the, the mid ground. The cliff face that you can see in the mid-ground, that's, uh, that's the deposits of the delta itself. And right in the background, you can actually see the rim of the crater. Uh, and what will actually happen um, is that eventually uh, Perseverance will leave Jezero Crater and will actually climb over the crater rim and to go to regions outside the crater, which are very exciting also. Yeah, I can imagine why it's so exciting, because this is genuine exploration. No one's been here before. Um, right. And you know when you when you're getting images like the ones we can see just now, it is tremendously exciting, isn't it? Because you you never know what you're going to find. Yeah, um, exactly. So this is this is a beautiful example here. This is one of our high value samples, Wildcat Ridge, um, and this very light toned deposit you can see here. These whitish rocks. These are very fine grained rocks. Um, and these are high priority samples uh, potentially for containing organics. Um, organic material. So the astrobiologists are very excited about this deposit. And then the other sample you can see there, Skinner Ridge, that's actually uh, a sample from this ridge that you can see that caps those white light toned rocks and those contain sand, gra sand grains, so that's a sandstone. And that will tell us something about the composition of rocks that were transported by these rivers from the hinterland uh, and tell us something about the conditions of transport basically. So we've got two very different samples that will tell us very different stories here. If you go to the next slide, I can tell you a little bit about, oh, next one. We, oh, we've covered this, but the next sorry, one. This one. And this is what we're where we are now at the moment. So we've left the front of the delta and we've been driving very, very rapidly uh, northwards and you can see this map just shows you that uh, sedimentary fan deposit or delta deposit and the uh, the yellow uh, symbol there indicates where we are and of interest to everybody here in the UK is that actually Perseverance is now in Wales, Wales on Mars. So the area <laughs> that we are in at the moment, the quad, the map quad has actually been named after, we've been naming map quads uh, where our locations on Mars after national parks around the world and that area is actually named after Pembrokeshire, so P Pembrokeshire Coastal uh, <laughs> National Park um, and that dot is actually at a place uh, that we've just arrived at called Scrinkle Haven which some of you may, may possibly on the audience may know is a place in Pembrokeshire in Wales and if you go to that final slide this is an image of actually where we are at the moment um, and uh, today will be, so this is from the HasCam image uh, camera on the rover and you can see these rocks uh, that are uh, actually inclined to the left. And um, today, so this was taken, uh, I believe a couple of days ago, 
And today we'll actually be at doing uh, analysis of these rocks using the rover payload. So probably using the SuperCam laser and taking high resolution images with the MarsCam Z cameras to try and characterize uh, these rocks. And then we'll be driving forward to a place uh, uh, a location on Mars that's being called after the town of Tenby in Wales. Excellent. Oh, if there's anyone from Wales watching, I bet they're thrilled uh, to see Wales getting a bit of recognition on on Mars. So incredibly exciting. Um, it's it's great news to hear that it's it, it seems to be going so well. Um, I had a quick question about um, just controlling the rover that I've always been curious about. Is it is it something where you have to, to kind of punch in the the, de the the coordinates and then send it and let it do its thing? Or is it is it almost on like a remote control? How, how does that actually work? Because Mark alluded to the fact that it takes forever to, you, it sounds like you can't just turn, you know, turn the joystick and push it the way you want it to go. It's a bit more complicated. Uh, it's very complicated. So there's huge teams of engineers. We, none of us do any of that business. That's, that's, <laughs> we're kind of the geologists there <laughs> who say, oh, we kind of like to go here. And then that goes to the engineers who very, very carefully uh, work out where we can go to, what we can do and write code for that, etc. cetera. Um, it's, and that's why we don't work real time because of the time delay. So basically we plan during what essentially whilst Mar the rover is asleep and during the Mars night, and then those plans get uplinked to the rover and they get carried out whilst we're sleeping essentially. There are some elements of autonomy, so driving, the rover can drive autonomously and um, it was called auto drive and we can basically auto nav and it's taking as it's driving it's taking images and comparing them and so it can actually go around obstacles etc and, and this enables the rover to actually drive up to two to three hundred meters um, without a, a rover driving having etc but most of the activities the science activities have to be pre-planned. Mm, yes, I, I can I, imagine. I was very disappointed not to be given a PlayStation controller when I uh, started my <laughs> operations. Yeah, that saved the mission, hasn't it, Mark, really? <laughs> <laughs> this is what I would, very wrong. Wrong. Yeah. I'd want to be driving it around with my little thumbstick. Um, but yeah, yeah, not quite, not quite that. All right, well, we're we're just about out of time. I'm going to ask if I can really quickly put one more question from, from our audience. Um, now, obviously, a, a lot of, there's a lot of interest in this mission about life, potential evidence of life on Mars. And um, one of our questions um, has come through says what happens if you bring back an unknown microorganism from Mars to Earth? Have the scientists taken measures to protect against those kinds of problems? Is this something that's occurred to you? Because obviously, you know, we're taking bits of Mars back. We don't know what's in those samples necessarily. Yeah, we we have I, I, I mentioned the uh, planetary protection considerations, so we we've already done quite a lot of work um, for the um, the analytical steps that we'll take to make sure that the sample is safe prior to its distribution and analysis by the wider population. So there's a very, very detailed prescribed procedure for making sure that that um, nothing from Mars gets out into the into the Earth, um, you know, without us knowing about it. So yeah. um, that's all taken care of. Excellent. Yeah, there's been too many sci-fi movies about that very problem, isn't there? So we've learned our lesson. Excellent. Well, we are unfortunately out of time. I knew it would fly past. Um, I'm really sorry, folks, we didn't manage to get to your particular question, but it's been really great uh, chatting to you all today and um, hearing about uh, your highlights from the mission. And the really exciting thing is this is ongoing. There's more happening. So um, I'm sure we'll be we'll, we'll get back together again uh, soon to find out uh, uh, what the what the rover has has discovered in the next few months. But thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm going to hand back now to HQ. Over to you. <laughs>